Thank you. Um, okay, can everybody hear? Okay, good. Uh, I want to, uh, we're going to try and catch up on time, so I want to first start by introducing Mindy Aloff, a wonderful dance critic and writer, feature writer for the New York Times, among others. Mindy is a dance editor of the University of Press of Florida and formerly a professor at Barnard College. Uh, her books include Hippo and a Tutu, Dancing in Disney Animation, Leaps in the Dark, Art and, w and the World by Agnes DeMille, the, unpictureless, the Unpicture Likeness of Pollock, Soutine, and Others, Dance Anecdotes, and a Collection of Poetry, Nightlights. Her essays and reviews on dance, literature, and film have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New Yorker, Village Voice, Dancing Times, and the Three Penny Review. She is a past president of the Dance Critics Association, a fellow of the Woodrow Wilson and John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundations, and a winner of the Whiting Writers Award. Okay, um, I just and I just to say to Mindy, Mindy wants to start by explaining what this publication is. Well, for, can you hear me? First, I'm going to start by thanking you for that extraordinary introduction. <coughs> and um, anyone who has been here over the summer and attended the yard knows that David White has put the yard on the map as a destination for dancing. And also in New York was um, uh, 17 years at the dance, 28 years at Dance Theater Workshop and made that a destination for performing. He's really one of the extraordinary presenters um, of dance, making it possible for people actually to dance for the public. Uh, I also want to thank very much the Book Festival for inviting me. I was shocked to be invited, I'm thrilled, and I've never been to Martha's Vineyard, and it's really a beautiful place. I particularly love the stone walls for which I presume this tent is named. The walls without mortars, <laughs> they're very lacy. And the stones come from um, a very distant time <laughs> in the past when there was a melt, apparently. And all the stones tumbled down in this direction. So it, much boulders much bigger than the ones that make up the walls. Uh, this anthology called Dance in America, a reader's anthology, it was titled by the press is not uh, is a book that I edited happily. I edited over nine years. I did tremendous amount of reading, but it's not something that I think of as my book in the way that most writers who are here today talk about um, their books. It is a special kind of anthology published by the Library of America. You may know. Uh, that publisher. It um, was founded with an effort to make an, an analogous, um, analogous publishing project to the French Playade um, publishing project where the great French writers could be found in print in editions that were uniform and beautifully produced. And the Library of America is known primarily for producing in, uh, books about indiv of work by individual writers, all of Philip Roth's um, uh, novels, all of John Updike's novels, everything by Herman Melville, every scrap of Emily Dickinson. Um, the, but they also have produced anthologies of writing that have been culled from newspapers and magazines, particularly amazing anthologies of war reporting from uh, all the major wars of the 20th century and possibly in preparation, even some wars from our benighted century. Um, I was quite happy that they agreed to have an anthology of dance writing because most people think that no one wrote about dance prior to um, prior to 1930. And even then, um, the, the idea is that no one wrote about, about dance well until um, the 1970s. When in fact, 
the television program for wi of which this is a namesake, Dance in America, which you may have seen on PBS, was um, uh, ignited what we call the second dance boom in America. The first, having been in World War II, uh, the home audiences who were desperate for something beautiful, knowing that either they or their family members may be going off and never coming back. Uh, that was a very important part of the first dance boom in the 1940s, when there was no television and you had to go to the theater. So, but my um, thoughts were, in putting this together, uh, was that there were many more writers and much more interesting writing going back centuries about dance. It just wasn't produced in the New York Times. It wasn't produced in the Atlantic or the New Yorker. It was in letters. It was in poems. It was in journals. It was in reports. Um, I didn't include, for example, there's an extraordinary report about how the uh, slaves from Africa who were brought over uh, in the 18th century were forced to dance on deck in order to keep them healthy. Um, you have to go through a lot of the library and I'm kind of, it's really a delight to follow someone who is um, uh, the writer who was speaking on behalf of libraries because that's where I spent much of the past nine years looking for reports um, and, and all kinds of non journalistic writings. So this book, I get no royalties for this book. It, uh, everything that um, comes into the Library of America goes to the Library of America for p future publishing projects. And many of the people who worked on this did so really out of love um, and volunteering. So that's, that's the book. Um, Okay, so. Um, maybe, we, maybe we can go into some detail about some of this earliest writing, uh, particularly uh, maybe George Washington Cable. Um, you might okay. want to reference John Durang in the 17th century, or, with, or 18th century, sorry. John Durang was in my hometown, and I really, he um, was a self-taught dancer, a ballet dancer, a, a jigger, a producer, a designer, a choreographer, and he had time to have, I believe it was nine children. So um, he was a very active individual. <laughs> and while he, and when he would get home at night, he would jot down what he had done that day. He would keep a journal. And it went through the very end of the 18th century into the early 19th century. And in the margins of the journal, he made watercolors of his dance, of himself in dances. Um, the journal was not the, the journal was not published until 1966, um, and so it was an astonishment to people who said there were no dance writers in the 18th century. In fact, you can find a hornpipe uh, that you yourselves could do if you were so interested in doing a hornpipe. All the timings are there. All the steps are there. Uh, the music, the suggested fiddle music is there. And that hornpipe was incorporated by jo one of John Durang's sons, all of whom went into the theater and they loved him very much and they wanted to keep a part of, part of his dancing alive. This is how much dancing survives because people loved it very much. George Balanchine's great ballet, Di Divertimento Number no. 15, he said, ah, it's a Mozart ballet, nobody will be interested. And the dancers were interested. And they said, we're keeping this in repertory. And that is often the story of why ballets survive a very long time. Um, Let's move to the 18th century. 
Well, I mean, you jumped to the, to 20th, the 19th century. century. George Washington. No, not the end. Yes, the 19th century. George Washington Cable. Sorry to have gone off on that. George Washington Cable uh, lived at first in the South. He lived in Louisiana, and he wrote an amazing eyewitness um, essay about Place Congo. Is anyone here from Louisiana, from New Orleans? Uh, Place Congo no longer exists as such, but at one time it was a place where the slaves of that city were allowed an hour off on Sundays to go dance and make music. And Cable uh, clearly studied many, many Sundays of people doing dance and music there. And several decades later, he recorded his memories. They are absolutely extraordinary. They um, include memories of the dances, memories of the music, memories of the tempi, memories of the actual surround of how it looked, how it felt to be in Place Congo on Sunday afternoon. He also recorded where many of the dancers came from in Africa, which he had studied based on their physiognomies. This is an amazing piece of writing from 1888. It was published in the Century Magazine, and it uh, has some beautiful sentences in it. David yeah. is going to read a couple of the I sentences. I think also it's a, a, a pure example in some ways of anthropological writing, right? I mean, in the sense, and even and sociological too, because everything is mentioned about the, what you mentioned, the surround, the context within which these things happen. But bear with me, everybody. Yonder glistening black Hercules, who plants one foot forward, lifts his head and bare shining chest, and rolls out a song from a mouth and throat like a cavern. He is a candio, a chief, or was before he was overthrown in battle and dragged away, his village burning behind him from the mountains of the high Sudan. That is an African amulet that hangs around his neck, a grigri. He is of the Bamaras, and as you may know by his solemn visage and the long tattoo streaks running down from the temples to the neck, broadest in the middle like knife gashes, see his play of restrained enthusiasm catch from one bystander to another. They swing and bow to right and left in slow time to the piercing treble of the Congo women. Some are responsive, some are competitive, Hear that barefoot slap the ground, one sudden stroke as if it were the foot of a stag. The musicians warm up at the sound. A smiting of breasts with open hands begins very softly and becomes vigorous. The women's voices rise to a tremulous intensity. Among the chorus line of Frank Kondo, Congo singing girls is one extra good voice <coughs> who thrusts in now and again an improvisation. This girl here, so tall and straight, is a yalof. You see it in her almost Hindu features and hear it in the plaintive melody of her voice. Now the chorus is more pur pursing than ever. The women clap, their hands in time, or standing with arms akimbo, receive with faint curtsies and head liftings the low bows of the men who deliver them swinging this way and that. And now for the frantic leaps, now for the frenzy. Another pair are in the ring. The man wears a belt of little bells or as a substitute little tin vials of shot called Bram Bram's Sonnet. And still another couple enter the circle. What wild, what terrible delight. The ecstasy rises to madness. One, two, three of the dancers fall. Blukutum, boom, with foam on their lips and are dragged out by arms and legs from under the tumultuous feet of the crowding newcomers. The musicians know no fatigue. Still the dance rages on. We don't have a lot of dance writing like that now. Um, <laughs> alas, because films have taken over most of the work that that kind of writing does. Um, people say, uh, um, but you know, I want to see it on film. I want to see the motion in motion, or even photography. Um, so anyway, George Washington Cable had to move to the north because for writing things like that, he received a lot of um, very unfavorable um, uh, criticism from his fellow 
Louisianers. So he eventually ended up in the North. But he, that's a wonderful example. Charles Dickens uh, is my vote for the best writer on deaths ever in English. And um, A Tale of Two Cities, if, you look in, if you've read A Tale of Two Cities or plan to read it, it has a dance a description of a dance called the Carmagnole, which is what the revolutionaries did in the streets. And it is an absolutely amazing uh, description that brings you into the dance. It's not to observe the dance, it's to bring the reader there. Um, again, Dickens represented a, um, another, in a sense, sort of reportage. I mean, sort of a reporter's sensibility and also uh, a kind of anthologist, or not anthologist, but an anthropologist's um, eye, in a sense of making connections and landing what he was watching within the social sphere around it. Well, he was a reporter. He was a journalist. He was a novelist. He, was, he loved the theater. He was the head of a theatrical union. He loved to perform um, as an amateur, and he loved to dance himself with his family. He would dance with his daughters at home. But his eye, that's something really different from doing it. And I think any dancer will tell you that just because a person is a brilliant dancer doesn't make the person a brilliant observer. You have to have, um, you have to have a kind of sensitivity of perception and then be able to conduct your perceptions into language. That's a really special gift. And this anthology is an attempt to show some of the people who could do it pretty well. Yeah, and in this, I'm going to read a section here from Dickens where, when he was down in Five Points, which was the poorest section of New York, if you've ever seen the movie uh, Gangs of New, New York. York. Uh, takes place in that, you know, or sort of positioned in that place. Um, but he, in going up through these very dark and dangerous tenements and stuff, he sort of lands in a place where there seems to be some life. And um, this is what he, part of what he describes. The corpulent black fiddler and his friend who plays the tambourine stamp upon the boarding of the small raised orchestra in which they sit and play a lively measure. Five or six couples come upon the floor marshaled by a lively young Negro who is the wit of the assembly and the greatest dancer known. He never leaves off making queer faces and is the delight of all the rest who grin from ear to ear incessantly. Among the dancers are two young mulatto girls with large black drooping eyes and headgear after the fashion of the hostess who are as shy or fain to be as though they had never danced before and so look down upon the visitors that their partners can see nothing but the long fringed lasses. But the uh, lashes. But the dance commences. Every gentleman sets as long as he likes to the opposite lady and the opposite lady to him. And all are so long about it that the sport begins to languish, languish when suddenly the lively hero dashes into the rescue. Instantly the fiddler grins and goes at it tooth and nail. There is a new energy in the tambourine, new laughter in the dancers, new smiles in the landlady, new confidence in the landlord, new brightness in the very candles. Single shuffle, double shuffle cut and cross cut, snapping his fingers, rolling his eyes, turning in his knees, presenting the backs of his legs in front, spinning about on his toes and heels like nothing but the man's fingers on the tambourine, dancing with two left legs, two right legs, two wooden legs, two wire legs, two spring legs, all sorts of legs and no legs. What is this to him? And in what walk of life or dance of life does man ever get such stimulating applause as thunders about him when having danced his partner off her feet and himself, too, he finishes by leaping gloriously on the bar and calling for something to drink. So that dancer is named Juba. And anyone who's a tap dancer or has background in tap or jazz knows that Juba was, is considered the patriarch of, American ta of tap dancing. Um, and Five Points, of course, was the place where everyone was so poor that there were competitions between the Irish immigrants and the freed slaves. And tap dancing evolved from those competitions and that collaboration. Um, it was really a remarkable spot. I wouldn't, 
Dickens includes the surround of Five Points, which is the major jail of New York, the tombs. Tombs. Um, in the event, <laughs> there are many kinds of dancing. The, what you've been hearing are, are examples of writing that are really um, use fictional techniques to describe. In Dickens, for example, you can hear an arc a story just in the discussion of what the dancer did. There's a climax, there's, uh, there's an ending. Um, he describes the, the, uh, uh, the feeling of the people watching. All of that, that's a, a major novelist at work. But there are many other wonderful writings that are not by novelists. Um, David has some I'll just mention, too, I used a letter from George Balanchine to Lincoln Kirstein. Many people, for example, have said that Balanchine couldn't write in English. He didn't know English. In fact, he knew a great deal of English. He used to do the crossword puzzles in the Times every day. But he, uh, they said that Lincoln Kirstein ghost wrote his works. So here is a letter from him to Kirstein uh, which demonstrates that he knew enough English to, to um, uh, communicate with one of the uh, most literate um, authors of his time. And in the letter, among other things, Balanchine suggests that the New York City Ballet should have free tickets for children at every performance. And he says to Kirstein, it's not as stupid as it sounds because children have families and the families will come and buy tickets. And if you've ever taken a child to the Nutcracker, that's usually, or any Nutcracker, you know that it's the families who come and support the performances. So um, that is an amazing letter. And there are, there are other um, works that Balanchine wrote himself. Um, there's Susan Sontag has an essay oh, right. um, in there. She has many ideas about what dance critics should do and what they are doing. If you're a fan of Susan Sontag, I heartily recommend this essay. She um, recanted some of those ideas 20 years later, but it's a lot of fun to see her unfurl them and put them forth um, in, in 1980, which is when that is from. Um, also, this is a good segue to some of, the, of where we begin to find modern writing and dance. Um, and the movement towards a different kind of approach, a more descriptive, less judgmental in some way. I mean, it still may be infused with opinion, but um, in the, it's really, again, an attempt to really take description deeper into the um, exercise of dance, the performance of dance, the creation of dance. And she mentions Edwin Denby, the poet turned critic and former dancer, as you laid out, um, as a key person in that evolution. Um, Edwin Denby was is for most writers on dance uh, the great, great example of how to do it. He, um, he wrote f most of his m famous uh, dance reviews for the Herald Tribune during World War II when the actual dance critic Walter Terry was in service. Uh, Denby had... Um, had physical ailments and he couldn't serve. Uh, he was explaining what theatrical dance was to people who had no idea of its tradition, no, not ballet, not modern dance, not jazz. He, he was introducing the entire art form to readers of a newspaper. And in order to do that, he shortened his sentences he was very careful about $50 words. You don't fling out a lot of multisyllabic words in a sentence. You put one and you cosset it with black velvet, surround. 
um, he uh, and his he wore his learning very very lightly, and people love him for that. Yeah, I'm going to read something from um, uh, an essay by Denby, which is called The Flight of the Dancer, and I think was spurred by seeing Markova yes. um, in performance, you know, and he characterizes a variety of leaping techniques, but this is really an analysis of that, and also the impossibility of the great dancers being suspended in air as if the, flight, as if the leap stopped you know, as opposed to be any other kind of sort of gravity-based um, jumping. So here's just a, a, a small thing. And he, he talks about Markova, he talks about Taglioni, he talks about Nijinsky, he, he relates this all back in time and forward. Um, a leap is a whole story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. If you want to try it, here are some of the simplest directions for this kind of soaring flight. It begins with a knee bend. Knees turned out, feet turned out, and heels pressed down to get a surer grip and a smoother flow in the leg action. The bend goes down softly as if the body were being sucked to the floor with a slight accelerando. The thrust upward, the stretch of the legs is faster than the bend was. The speed of the action must accelerate in a continuous graduation from beginning of the bend into the final spring upward. So there will be no break in motion when the body leaves the ground. The leap may be jumped from two feet, hopped from one, or hopped from one with an extra swing in the other leg, but in any case, the propulsive strain of the leap must be taken up by the muscles around the waist. The back must be straight and per perpendicular as if it had no part in the effort. But that isn't all. The shoulders have to be held rigidly down by main force so they won't bob, up, bob upward in the jump. Really, there's as much, uh, there's much going on down there in the, in the legs and everything as there is through the arms. And um, the most obvious test for the dancer comes in the descent from the air, in the recovery from the leap. She has to catch herself in a knee bend that begins with the speed she falls at and progressively diminishes so evenly that you don't even notice the transition from the air to the ground. The knee bend, slow, knee bend slows down as it deepens to what feels like a final rest although it is only a fraction of a second long, so short a movie camera will miss it. So, and this should probably be our transition um, to a couple questions and then can, yeah. uh, but to, I want to tell you what, that, what it means to wear your learning lightly in the case of dance. You notice that passage begins, you can try it, which is a, a simple rhetorical flourish. You can try it if you want. Edwin Denby got to that because he was a great friend of painters in the 1930s, in particular Willem de Kooning, who was his neighbor, who had a cold water flat either next door to him or below him. And they used to have parties where they looked at photographs of Václav Nijinsky in air and tried themselves with no dance training at all to reproduce those actions. And everything he's saying that the dancer has to do, he got from having tried it first. Now, Edwin Denby was a trained dancer and a trained performer. He performed throughout Germany in the 1920s, um, but he, he was with a lot of people who had never danced a step, not even social dancing. So that comes into his, into his essay so gracefully. You can try it if you want. But that comes from people falling, breaking bones, <laughs> getting scrapes, and all kinds of it. That's what it means in dance writing, to wear your learning lightly. So, and he is a transitional figure, I think, in, in criticism. He, there was a book of his essays published called Dancers, Buildings, and People in the Street, which sort of encompasses everything. Yes, that, um, uh, that was edited by the poet Frank O'Hara, another friend of Denby's. Denby was the center of something called the New York School of Poetry, which some of you may know. Um, do you have any questions at all about the book?
I'm curious about how you decided to what 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 excerpts you'd put in. I understand you were looking at early writing, but how it was really, the book is really broad. Just you haven't pointed that out. Oh boy. I made a lot of rules for myself. I was there have been other dance an, uh, anthologies of dance writing. I said I will not raid them. That is I will not um, just go through and take half of somebody's anthology and put it in the book. Maybe there is a crossover of three or four out of a hundred uh, in, in a given anthology, but I wasn't going to do but that. But this book is very broad. You know, it has a lot of different sections, different ideas. Well, it also occurred to me that people would be more interested in yeah. dancing of our day. Yeah than of the past, although my feeling is it's the past that really needed the defense of the book. But um, the, uh, the writers I went through, you cannot have a, an anthology of dance writing without Edwin Denby in America. You can't have an anthology of dance writing without Arlene Croce in America, regardless of whether you like her work or not. Uh, to have an anthology without anything by or about George Balanchine seems um, <laughs> almost suicidal. It, but it also occurred to me that you, uh, we needed genres to be covered. A lot of vernacular dance is in here. There's a lot of writing about tap dancing. There's a lot of writing about jazz. Um, there's also writing about dance criticism itself. There's um, uh, writing about modern dance, quite a lot. Merce, by and about Merce Cunningham, by and about Paul Taylor. It's really full. It's really full. By and about Martha Graham, Stuart Hodes, began as a flyer in World War II, and he loved it. He wanted to stay as a flyer, but he was pulled into a dance class at the Martha Graham studio at the age of 22, and that was the end of him. And he, he, he became, well, it was the end of him as a flyer. He became a dancer and her partner. Um, and, uh, and then he went on to teach at Juilliard and to be the head of the dance program at Tisch at NYU and so on and so forth. And he has a very wonderful, funny explanation of what it means for a man to try to master the Martha Graham technique um, at the age of 22. Very interesting. Yeah. He's still dancing, and basically, still at the age of 100. Uh, well, not quite 100. He's 95. Oh, sorry. 95. Nearing 100. He just stopped driving, but he is still occasionally treading the boards. Dancing is good for you. Dancing is very good for you, healthful for you. Exactly. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being a good, patient audience. Really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Thank you.